back to the EPS podcast where everything is a primary source. I am Eric Paul and today I'm joined by Andrew. Uh, just like our very first full episode, I realize the first episode is a word about primary sources, but uh, the very first episode that we recorded on uh, breaking down a primary source was 1989's Batman. So welcome back. Hey everybody. It's so nice to have you here. And honestly, I, I think there are some comparisons between Batman and what we're going to be talking about today. <laughs> um, you know, different identities. And uh, I've even had people talk. I, I've read a thing about how uh, the character of Jay Gatz does sound like a Batman villain. And I think may yep. have been one, you know, the you know, Gatz like a gun. So what we're going to be talking about today is the cover art to 1925's uh, the Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. So we're we're going to, of course, at some point or another, talk about the story itself. It's going to happen, but uh, we're trying to focus our best on the design concepts and the graphic art of the Great Gatsby's um, iconic eyes. And so a few, you know, the, the celestial eyes painting. A few months ago, I was with my wife walking around town and uh, we looked into a uh, a bookstore window the bookstore was closed so it was just kind of uh you know taking a look through the window and see what they had on display and i saw a, a book of the great gatsby and it had a completely different cover it was the grill of a 1920s car and i know that cars play a major role in the storyline they're almost characters in their own way in the the great gatsby but i just i couldn't help but say to myself like of all the covers in the world i think that this one the uh, Francis Cougat or Cougat uh, painting is one that can't be replaced. Um, do, do you feel the same way about this cover? Yeah, it, well, it, it is weird that like I am. <laughs> this goes against typically my, my I love new stuff and I like, you know, cover songs. And when someone takes something original and kind of mixes it up, I, I like that concept. Um, but there are I think there are certain things that are, are sacred because of their meaning. And this is one of those things that like every time I've seen a new version of this cover, I've just been let down, um, you know, be, because it, it feels like the, the, the goal is not to capture the meaning or connection with the novel, but more just to take basic elements of the novel, uh, superficial understandings of the novel and, and make it visually attractive. So another person will pick it up or, you know, for nerds like me who are constantly getting new editions of things just to pick up yet another one. Um, like, I, so for example, this kind of is a perfect time for this. Um, the graphic novel version of yeah. this novel just came out. Um, and, and, you know, the, the past couple of years has been a lot, a lot of interest in, in taking classic literature and, and giving it a go um, you know, in the graphic novel form, uh, because it, for years that had been kind of like, I don't know, it, almost like low humor. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember as a kid watching the film Major League, and there's a, a great bit where Tom Berenger's uh, ex-wife is trying, like, she, she left him because he wasn't cultured enough. And so he's trying to like up his culture by reading the classics. But of course, he's reading like the 1960s comic book version of Moby Dick. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's meant to be a you know, humorous take because they were just these simplistic yeah. versions, whereas the new ones are indeed they're They are actually, you know, worthy, of maybe not successors, but additions to the mythology. And so um, long story short, I, I'm looking at the cover for the, uh, the graphic novel version um, and aesthetically it's got it's got the 1920s aesthetic to it but you look at it it, it just it, it's a pool party at gatsby's yeah. uh you know there's a guy playing the violin there's people kind of lounging about as they do in, in gatsby um but there, there's there's just no insight into the novel it's purely the 1920s kind of rich dilettante aesthetic yeah. as opposed to what the original you know um i, I wish i knew how to pronounce his name kuja um, I'll have to look it up. Um, that that painting, there's so much to talk about there that my, my students and I end up talking about that at least for almost one whole class period. Yeah. Um, and I, just, I feel like any later editions have just lacked what that one just intrinsically has. Yeah. Because I mean, the, like you said, the, I like, I do 
technically because I like the story so much, I'll pretty much appreciate any cover art. Yeah. But I'm looking at some of the examples, including the the most recent one, the graphic novel one. But yep. some of them and all of them are reflections of their own individual time period. And so technically we could probably make a podcast just great Gatsby cover art the podcast <laughs> and cover each one of them yeah you know no pun intended to yeah uh, decide what they say about each era yeah, because you can see the ones from the 80s where it looks like the same kind of covers like sweet valley high or the babysitters yep. club like those very you know realistic image you know portraiture kind of things or like those yep. images um where there's some that are you know from the 30s or the 40s which are art deco in their own way you know that you know not that this one is i mean this is the definition of art deco but the yeah uh, and then there's ones that every time it comes out in movie form it including the most recent movie they have just the movie poster as the cover art so that's very clear that you know they're just trying to to demonstrate that the story is still relevant and look they keep making it into hollywood pictures so you should like it but to me this one is so incredible because of the story behind it it's yeah. not as yeah. simple as somebody who said all right yep give me the gist of the story and i'll write i'll draw you up a, a picture uh, or you know the, the luxury that the other artists have had is that as time goes on this thing has become much more the classic piece of literature and so they they have so much more of to work with as far as all right, you know this story, so let me just paint a picture on the cover of the book so you know, yeah, this is the right one. Um, yeah. You know, in some versions, F. Scott Fitzgerald's name is bigger than the title. Yeah. You know, so then it is. But so anyway, this one, um, you know, the first question with any primary source and what we're trying to figure out is what does this tell us about mid-1920s American society, culture, economics, I mean, this is the very reason why the book itself is chosen in so many high school settings to read because it is a perfect primary source of yeah. you know, 100 years ago. Uh, it's, a, it's an ultimate 1920s thing. So what materials is made from? And the paint, you know, the the canvas, the, the paper, all that stuff, that's, of course, to be understood as that's part of the material. But in this case, uh, it's it's the book itself the story itself is part of the material and one of the things that the artist uh Kujat had at his disposal was uh and he wasn't a book designer by trade he he had he was a graphic artist but he wasn't somebody that made a career this is the only book cover he ever did yeah yeah before or after um and he has this story that he gets into he starts reading uh, on the Ash Heaps of Millionaires, which was one of the original titles that Fitzgerald was working with. And he starts to paint elements of it. So it's a, it's definitely a woman's face hovering over a city skyline with the lights. And you can see what looks like a tear, but it's actually a green light, which is a major component of the story itself. And most people superficially just assume that this is a nod to and a, a very important component to the story, which is the aging, uh, you know, weather torn billboard of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg, which are two eyes looking through spectacles, you know, the eyes of God. Uh, so if any you know, high schoolers are listening to this as they're trying to uh, read the great Gatsby and get the meaning of it. We just kind of gave away uh, the, the imagery, but there are some who believe, and actually it's pretty well stated that Fitzgerald saw the early renditions of celestial eyes. And that's what actually put the billboard billboard of Dr. TJ Eckelberg into the, to the book. Is that something you've heard as well? Yeah, that's I, I and I like I you know you mentioned before we started recording that you, you try not to do too much research so it's a genuine conversation. I, I try to do the same, but unfortunately, as I teach this novel every year, you know I'm constantly bringing this stuff up, and and, and I, I've seen multiple sources where they talk about this that that you know the painting was created before the novel was finished, and, and that Fitzgerald, you know, like when he wrote this, it, it like it, he painstakingly wrote this and went through multiple drafts. 
um, and, and things changed and, and it's pretty well confirmed that the art was done and he had previewed it. And then the book went through some changes. And of course, like, you know, there's no like <laughs> Fitzgerald commentary. Like, yes, I changed this because, mm -hmm. um, but it, it does seem to be that, that like the, the art itself reflected what the novel was, but the novel also kind of sh was shaped and reflected by this piece of art. Um, which, like he's mentioned before, it's not the normal process. The normal process is a book goes out, it goes to you know the publishing company, and they edit it, um, and then they they hire someone to to do a cover, and they have an in-house yeah. person who does covers. Um, I actually found a, a, a part, you know a couple of years ago when I did this, I found a, an article on Vox um, that was kind of just like acknowledging the iconic nature of this this cover, um, and then kind of looking at like how do how do you go about redesigning this? Because that, that that's what ends up happening when you contract out that eventually the, you know, the publishing company loses rights to that cover. Mm -hmm. um, they need to update it. And you know, there's an urge for them to update just so, you know, to get more bookstores to buy it, maybe update it for the era. So more people will buy it because it reflects the aesthetic of the time. Um, and then looking at those other covers um, and I, I've just now pulled up just a whole host of them. Um, they, they, just like you mentioned before that they are, they're reflective of when they're made and, and you know, the art style, the art material. Um, but none of them really are able to, to capture much more than, you know, like the grill of the car. There's one with, um, you know, like uh, Gatsby wearing one of those kind of 1920s uh, hats. And it says F. Scott Fitzgerald on the top. And just, like, we don't actually see his face. Um, I think the most recent one I found um, is a kind of a gatefold cover mm -hmm. that looks, it's got the green light on one of the inserts. It's got the Great Gatsby written almost at kind of looking like buildings and, and gardens. Um, and then on the back is a tipped over my a champagne glass and a martini glass still standing up. So and those I, more recent ones have so much more. It seems like they're having a lot of fun with it. Yeah. That, that, like, I remember you turning me on to some posters a couple of years ago. There was a poster maker and you, I'm sure you know the name. I don't. But the, there's a particular movie theater, I think, in Austin, Texas. That oh, yeah. Read, you know, they, they show old older movies, you know, classic movies, yeah. modern classics. And they have a graphic artist who comes in and, and reimagines the posters. Yeah. And a lot of them are very art deco in their design. Yep. And so it, it adds a fun. He, he probably has a great time thinking about what can I do with. Yep these movies and in yeah. the same token i think a lot of the modern uh cover artists are probably saying yeah what can i do with the great gatsby yeah it yeah. can't uh, it can't obviously just take the celestial eyes one and just redo that his kid um, can redo it know, so let me find other themes from the story and and illustrate that or you know what are the aspects that the reader the audience i'm, I'm going after what would they get the most out of yeah um, what all this tells me about uh, 1920s America is just what a, a meeting place that time period was of so much media. The, it was really the birth of the mass media as we know it. Oh, certainly. You have, you know, because both um, the the art, the art author and the illustrator were born within just a few years of each other. So they're in the same mm -hmm. exact generation. Yep. from two totally different backgrounds. Fitzgerald is American, whereas Cujat is Spanish and had uh, moved around quite a bit in his early life and, and settled down in New York right around the same time that Fitzgerald did mm -hmm. to, to get into this world. But such an arrival, such a, like a nexus almost of everything from visual arts, from you know still images when it comes to paintings or portraiture, motion pictures were on the rise and they were developing. Uh, um, <laughs> and you have, uh, in this case, writers who are, and so much of this is a direct impact of the first world war. Oh, certainly comes into the story itself, but this you know, lost generation artists and writers and illustrators and, and just, uh, you know, everybody there, but also the fact that the United States, uh, it, our, our entire economy, unlike most of Western Europe, was largely intact after the First World War. There was mm -hmm. some reorganization going on, but it was it was really unlike that of uh, Britain and France and definitely Germany, mm -hmm. uh, not suffering and not reeling to the same degree as as those. And so the United States was was ready to really open up this new age. Yeah. Uh, and and that's where we're all here. So you have basically a story underway 
he gets inspired by it. He starts painting this this painting inspired by the story, which then reverses itself, and the rest of the rewrites get inspired by. It. I mean, talk about just you know, it's like holding up two mirrors to each other. You know, just endless supply of stuff, and that really it, it that paints a picture of the time period. Um, now, who likely made it? And we we know who made it. It was you know, like I said, it was Francis or Francisco uh, Cujat. I'm sure I'm not saying it's it right. I, he's Spanish, so I, I'm making that uh, the G sound um, not quite a, a hard G the same way. Maxwell Perkins was the publisher of um, the the book, and he had a number of you know he's he's just as as symbolic of the time period as uh, the the writers that he worked with, and he referred to this as a masterpiece for the book. Mm -hmm. in a letter to Fitzgerald um, and the maker's status in society. We can, we can answer this one at the same time and, and see what it yeah. tells us. Yeah. So um, Cujo, Cujat was a graphic artist. He was a portrait painter. He came from a very creative family in Spain. Uh, he had moved around some, he had gone from Spain to, to Cuba in 1903 uh, worked as a portrait artist in Paris, in South America, in Cuba, so very well traveled. Uh, he moves to the United States in early um, 1920, around 1920, and is recognized for his talents uh, in Chicago. And there he was painting opera cards for uh, the Chicago opera houses and, and so forth. And then mm -hmm. he eventually... Uh, works his way over to New York, where he starts his his work with the graphic design for things like uh, some early films. Eventually, he moves out to Hollywood. So actually, in 1925, right after The Great Gatsby comes out, he moves mm -hmm. out to Hollywood. And by the 1940s, he has been become a consultant with a lot of the uh, well, even before that, throughout the 20s, he, he had done some work for doing uh, set design for a lot of movies, and especially ones that were set in South America or in Spain. So he had a, a particular eye for detail when it came to how those should look. Mm -hmm. But um, I would say that somebody who is in the visual arts definitely was having an elevated status throughout the 1920s. Mm -hmm. uh, that if you had a talent for being able to put images out there, make them look exciting and vibrant and eye-catching, this was definitely an age for you. Um, so the 1920s were all about being seen and being recognized being seen. Um, and as somebody such as yourself who works so, well, so much with visual arts, um, do you seem to trace... Again, I mean, I'm just full of puns that I don't even mean to <laughs> so trace the the drawing and the painting arts and just basically graphic design. Is it is would you say the 20s is kind of like the birth of that era? Yeah. Well, uh, so, I mean, <laughs> I think it's the birth of the the way we look at it. Sure. Um, I think the graphic design it, it, you know, is I mean, you could argue. I mean, we could do a whole other podcast where we talk about the kind of the, the, the origin of graphic design. I, I teach a class um, about comic books and graphic storytelling, and we talk about kind of yes, you can look at the comic strips of the you know eighteen nineties or so, and then all, all the way through the nineteen twenties, and talk about oh, that's the origin of comics. But you can date it even further back. The the first class we literally talk about you know the Lasco caves and things like that, and so like I think in one sense you're absolutely right that the nineteen twenties in terms of graphics design and and that that meeting point between different you know mediums and genres and things like that really mm -hmm. as far as we understand it is it dates back to the 20s um and, and as an english teacher i look at it you know the 1920s is such a special era um because it w there's a global connection that like you can connect to world war one you can connect it to you know, the, the stock booms in the 20s and you know, eventually the crash uh, and the depression, yeah. the dust bowl and all this stuff, all these things kind of swirl together to get this interconnectivity between different mediums of art and expression. You know, like we, we have all these American expatriates who are floating around Europe and France and Spain 
meeting these artists um, who, you know, like Kuja or, or however you pronounce his name. Um, old I, Francis I, C. Yeah, Old Francis C. There you go. Um, I, so C. I, I, I it, it's funny to even think about how how it's a chicken or the egg, like what came first, what influenced what on, on the macro level, just all these artists and writers and musicians and on the micro level of the of Gatsby itself, you know, like if you look at it, Fitzgerald himself and his history, clearly his own experiences are just littered throughout Gatsby, right? Yeah. The, the, like it really is a semi autobiographical look at himself, his own experiences, his own anxieties. Um, but it, it's also clear that, that there was some connection between this piece of art and where the story eventually like went. And so I think that's one of the reasons why I regard this cover so highly. It's not just about Gatsby and its connection to that. It, it's also so indicative of the time where, yeah, the art style does reflect 1920s, but there's more to it than that. That, mm. that There's such a historical connection between all these things. And I, I think after this podcast, I'm going to go and I'm going to look at the other covers for, for other books of the time, you know, Hemingway and things like that, because I, I feel like there is there's something there that, that is just important. Um, you know, that, that like, it's so but, reflective. Yeah. I mean, I, I did look up cover art for some of Fitzgerald's cronies, like Hemingway and the sun also rises <laughs> and um, a farewell to arms. Yeah. Their cover art. And I don't know if it was just the, the quick sampling that I took, but their cover art is, it looks nothing like this one. It, it's very simple and I mean, this one's simple too, in it, but it's also involved. I mean, it, it, but it's just yeah. like. What do you mean? It, oh, sorry, God. It's, it's not quite the same. For some reason, this one does separate itself um, so much more. Yeah. Because of its, I don't know, just something about it, it draws you in. It, it's, whereas the, the other ones really don't. It's just kind of like, oh, yeah, there's, you know, a guy on the cover of the book. And, you know, you know even the, the previous one, um, Fitzgerald's big, you know, the, his first book in 1920, uh, This Side of Paradise, yep. has a very simple, you know, yeah. very just kind of narrative, you know, like, here's a man and a lady. And yeah. <laughs> and well, that's, you know, that's why I was, I was saying that uh, this cover is so special because I think those covers reflect the art of the time and the basic, you know, kind of, um, feel of the time i guess yeah um and like especially if you look at hemingway's you're just like oh that makes sense right like the, the hemingway is this no proof writer like literally has these short choppy sentences and you look at the art like oh, okay so it's it, it's just like a basic pastiche of the novel yeah. there's no deeper connection there it's like oh so also rises with some basic imagery um there you there. Go. <laughs> yeah here you go um where whereas maybe it's because of how personal um Gatsby was to Fitzgerald that, that they felt, you know, comfortable getting a, a, an outside artist to like create an actual piece of art yeah. or, you know, I, I would love, I have so many days where I'm like, I wish I had a time machine and a Harry Potter esque invisibility cloak, just so I could fly on the wall, see these conversations. I'm sure more often than not, I would just be disappointed, you know, yeah. like I'd, well, I've I'd been go working and... on my time machine in my garage for a while, uh, <laughs> missing a few parts, but I, yeah. you know, I'm Flux sure capacitor. find a way. Yeah, if you but work like, on the invisibility cloak, I'll work on the time machine. We'll go. Well, that's. I, I I've I've always loved you know time travel movies and stuff like that. But I, I've always in the back of my head been like, there's no way that I'm gonna meet like Teddy Roosevelt and he's gonna live up to the character I've created in my mind. You know, like yeah, that 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 he's just gonna be a letdown. There there was actually I think there was a TV show on Fox a couple of years ago called Making History, and the premise was a moron creates time travel yeah. and is traveling back to the revolutionary era. And every single person is just a disappointment. They're all yeah. like just as dumb as we are, just as like you know brutish and stupid as we are. It's just over time their legends. It's been built, built up. up so much. Yeah, yeah. Well, which I, is I think that, about the with with this one specifically though the Woody Allen movie uh, Midnight in Paris really does yes. actually go directly yes. towards this because yeah. you have a character that is just he's a bored he's a writer and he's like ah, yeah you know I wish I could live in a time and he goes back to the twenties yeah and meets these expatriate writers and he's excited to be there and they're all saying oh god i wish i could go back to a 30 years before and you know yeah. see what things were like back in the 1890s that's when you know this city was coming alive and that's when our craft was at its height and it's that idea i mean look at the last words in the great gatsby yeah 
I mean, that says it all right there is that we're yeah. always looking back to previous time periods for inspiration and we can't just let go of the past. Like it's yeah. all about the past. So maybe you and I here almost a hundred years <laughs> later are <laughs> heeding his words. Exactly. Be like, oh, yeah, this certainly. is the only book cover that matters. All the other ones are garbage. This one, well, not garbage, but uh, <laughs> this one is the book cover. Yeah. Um, but then, I mean, I think that's part of the, the answer to the next question. Why did they make it? Yeah. Um, I think they knew how special this story was before it went into press. And that's why this special care went into, you know, you have this very well recognized and respected graphic artist, this painter comes in and makes this, this one. It's a, you know, it's almost as if you asked, uh, I don't know if I want to put them at the same level as Michelangelo, but uh, you know, how many cathedral walls was he painting? You know, he did the one, you know, cause yeah. it's like, it's something special. Um, <sighs> but ultimately the reason why they made it was to help sell it. Right. Yeah. You know, they, they wanted to sell, to sell the book that it wasn't just, you know, one day a bunch of high school kids are going to have to read this and we want to make it look, you know, yeah, so, we class so, it they up. Don't, so they don't lose it. Right. You yeah. know, so they can tell the difference between this one and the other books that they have to read. Well, um, it, this was about sales. It, it was yeah. all about selling it, which um, I, I tried to find the numbers and it looked like right after it came out somewhere close by the end of the decade, it was close to 3.7 million copies of the great Gatsby sold. Yeah. Um, so what does that tell you about the 1920s that they would be willing to go to such lengths of hiring a professional artist to make this cover art? What does that tell you about the book market in that, in that time period? Well, <laughs> the, the, so like, oh, I, I have a bunch of things to say. Um, number one, going back just briefly to our talk about time travel uh, yeah. and that, that just basic human desire to look backwards more fondly maybe than we should. I think that that is one of the reasons why this cover art is so iconic that that's clearly a big part of the book, but looking at the cover art itself, it, it's somehow like, I know when it came out, but even when it came out, it had that aesthetic of looking back with fondness, you know, almost through like uh, you know, tear covered eyes yeah. that everything's kind of watery and then there's a fondness to it, but there's also a, a message there. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I look at, I, I think if I recall correctly, Gatsby wasn't a runaway success when it was first published that, you know, it was a tougher sell for people, you know, with a, the, there's a murder and there, there's crime and things like that, which were not mm -hmm. in vogue at the time. Um, and so like looking at how many of it eventually sold, um, you know, it, it's resurgence. Um, I, I think that it speaks to a couple things. Um, number one, that, that we were a much more literate society, I think because there, there weren't as many, you know, avenues for entertainment as there are now. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I recently, because I'm a comic book fan, I think I, you know, I, I hear more of this, that I think that the public perception is, oh, these creators, they're, they're, they're these, you know, fat cats who they sold a book and they're just top of the game whatever but it's so much harder now for a single writer of, of whatever um mm -hmm. or artist to make a mark because there are so many more avenues you know it, it, like it like social media alone uh my yeah. instagram i you know I, I have the usual family and friends up there but most of my instagram is just artists i like yeah. um and a lot of them don't even really work in comics all that much they just put their stuff on on social media and, and they get a buzz going and then they sell it on their websites, um, which is it, it, it's a great way to make money. That, that's awesome. But like, I think that you look back at Gatsby's, I'm sorry, uh, Fitzgerald's era. Um, and I think part of those book sales numbers um, speak to kind of the, the, the desire for our culture to be entertained um, mm -hmm. as well as the, 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 this, you know, the, there were, there were movies, but they weren't, you know, nearly as revered or yeah. ubiquitous as they are now. That that and movie movies find themselves in the book briefly. Yeah, they they yeah. mention about you know in the hottest day of the year going to see a movie and just yeah. escaping the heat and and they you know poo poo that idea. But it yeah, does, it's almost like, almost like a novelty to them. Right. Well, I mean, it's an acknowledgement that that was an option. You know, that yes. there was, yeah, exactly. You know, a way to be entertained other than just you know it's either reading or nothing you know yeah uh, but it, you know, we can use this to to because i think it goes hand in hand and one of the other questions that is who is the intended audience and you mentioned this 
um, there was a growing readership. I, I looked at some numbers because I find that books in particular, or newspapers, circulation of any kind of printed material, you know, text has to acknowledge that people can read. Yeah. Because those are the two things that you need, one of the two things that you need in order to have a book industry or any kind of print culture is to have a population that can read and has the time to read. And, and has, the, has the money to read as well. Right. The, the, in know, this case, to income. buy the book instead of just yep. going to the library and hoping that you know, there are one or two copies is available. So in yep. 1910, 8% of the population above the age of 10 was illiterate. So 92% of teenagers and adults were literate. And then mm -hmm. by 1930, mm -hmm. uh, there's only 4% of the population is illiterate. So it's gone up with 96%, thanks mostly to this book. I imagine, um, you know, everybody learned to read, you know, with yeah. around reading Gatsby. But uh, I think that what all this says, like you've mentioned already about the, the time period, is that people had more time and they had more money. And this all goes back to the a, a number of things, including, you know, continuous automation of the society, yep. electricity. I mean, there's electricity on this co book cover. You can yep. see that electric light just glowing and electric light also extended the daytime and your yep. ability to read. So, you know, reading hours weren't just up until when the sun went down, you know, the pattern of people's days was changing quite a bit. I, I tell my students uh, as a history teacher, I say, whenever I introduce the 1920s to them, I always point out, I said, if you went again, back in time with the time machine I'm working on and found <laughs> yourself in the 1920s, you'd probably get along. Okay that you would understand the lingo you would be able to find, you know the the infrastructure of the country was coming together there were telephone lines um you know, going up and down next to paved roads that were getting better and more mm -hmm. car conducive mm -hmm. uh there was uh the subway systems and the train systems had been around for a long time you know all this would be very familiar to us not to mention the music the uh the like jokes the, the senses of humor all these things were very much the origin the 20s were the first modern era really and um but it, it still shows us that books factored in as a major player in people's entertainment and interests that they weren't just oh. uh con ha content with having a screen on because if you wanted to watch a screen you had to go somewhere to do that very exactly. few people had their own movie theaters in their house. Only the ultra rich, only the Buchanan types might have something like that, a screening room in their house. Um, so is that something that you also read from uh, the fact that they made it to sell, you know, so you would pick Gatsby and not another book, you know, uh, on the same, you know, whatever other Fitzgerald or on the letter F <laughs> section. <laughs> yeah, well, that's another thing too. I wonder if bookstores, if they've, because uh, they don't organize themselves the same way as a library. Um, my librarian wife used to say that oftentimes people would come into the library in, in this age where bookstores, like those big bookstores like Barnes and Noble have been existing for most of our lives that uh, they come in, they're like, well, where's the, you know, this section or where's that section? And she's like, well, you know, we organize things by the Dewey Decimal System here, not by the, uh, topic necessary i mean it goes by topic yeah. but it's not whereas bookstores they tend to have like they have those tables or they set up special and libraries do that too and I, i'm sure libraries do that as a reaction to bookstores as a way to you know they set up their their special display areas so that to replicate the experience but ultimately the stacks of books all around the library are not organized mm -hmm. the same way that a bookstore would be and you know, because there's an exchange of money <laughs> that, you know, the bookstore is trying yeah. to sell these things so they can keep their lights on and so forth and so on. So yeah. uh, do, do you feel the same way that um, the reason why they put so much into getting this book to have this cover that it does, th does that sell, tell you something about people's spending power of the era? Yeah. So, I mean, like you said, the, the, if being a student of history, you always, you can never acknowledge there's never one, it's a thousand different and so I think that the, the part of it is the, the money, the time. Um, I think a big part of it is 
you know, like I, I talk about my students that uh, the, the kind of driving thrust behind Romanticism was this idea of escapist literature, getting out of these crowded, dirty cities that came up out of the age of reason, mm-hmm. out into the wilderness, uh, mm-hmm. to romantic lives. They couldn't, they just couldn't afford to or didn't have the ability to live. Um, that we were kind of distant from reality. And so I look at the 1920s and you've got a culture with all this time in their hands, um, all this money kind of flowing in, you've got greater literacy, um, but you've also got a time where, where people are looking to be entertained um, and people are also looking to maybe distance themselves from the realities of World War I um, and some of the kind of the dirty edges of that, that boom era. And so I think, all of these things kind of swirl together to create such a demand for entertainment, for media, for distractions, for, mm-hmm. for, you know, ways to escape the mundane. Um, look at the, you know, the, the great depression, look at the obsession with celebrity um, and lurid criminal tales yeah. during the 1920, late twenties and early thirties. Like John Dillinger was a, a, like a direct, you know, like it w- w- was directly affected by this and the perception of him and Bonnie and Clyde and all these people was directly affected by, you know, the downtrodden nature of America and the, the, the you know, need for those good stories. Um, and also to some extent that the need for newspapers to sensationalize those yeah. and create heroes out of just bad people. Um, and I, I think that's th- that, that desire to be entertained and to have, you know, have a story I don't want to be self-centered, but I, I think it is uniquely American to just like d- that desire to have a story. Like what oh, is going absolutely. on? There? I mean, that's, yeah. that's one of the themes of Gatsby itself, yeah. Yeah. you know, between the two eggs that the West egg is the Americans, you know, it's the, the Midwesterners. It's the people that you know made America the way that it had by that point. And the East eggs are all the, the old money there, the English you know, yeah. infused um, society. They're, basically the old world and uh, you're absolutely right about that i think that it's um and this particular painting celestial eyes yeah has so much i think it has a lot more of a relationship in that you know you mentioned about how by the 30s people were looking for stories in their newspapers about these larger life figures or making them larger in life because of their media exposure and isn't that really i mean this is this book and just the way that it, it's portrayed and the way it communicates itself just by its cover art makes it difficult to distinguish between fact and fiction that it looks like. And the story itself could easily find itself in the sensational newspapers of the era into the 1930s. And so it's almost like, I mean, that's one of the commentaries that Fitzgerald makes with the book, but by having such the, the cover art that it does that informed his story potentially and his story informing and influencing so many other people's understandings of things. It yep. just, it's like a cycle. It just really is very yeah. cyclical in the way it all works out, which corresponds and correlates perfectly with the growing mass media of, you know, the twenties and the third, I mean the thirties, yeah. it was a great depression era, but it didn't slow down. My, la- my last no. podcast was about uh, episode was about a movie that came out at the end of the 1930s and there's a reason why it's the golden age of Hollywood. Oh yeah. It was the mass media, particularly the visual media was becoming so in high demand and therefore in high supply. And people were just finding their, the differentiation between fact and fiction that much harder to, to do a yeah. lot of times. So, you know, this is a, a, a very iconic of the era uh, item. And, and I'm glad that we're talking about it so deeply uh, the next one is what ideas or behavior does this convey? And with visual art, like a painting, that is what they're trying to do is convey a lot of messages in one piece of artwork. So in this case, yeah. it's a painting of uh, a woman's eyes inside of her eyes are two female nudes in uh, poses. And so it's, you know, and that's something that, uh, definitely like a subliminal message sent by the painter that that says so much right there. But then yeah. like I mentioned before about the, the way that um, it has elements of the story, like the green light, the, the green light of envy, 
uh, is also a tear. Are these Daisy's eyes? And by extension, is this uh, Zelda? Um, so this is like the original legend of Zelda uh, is <laughs> this painting. Um, do you do you uh, do you do you think that the artist was trying to to paint a specific character from the story, or was he just taking the look of a woman's face from the era and, and superimposing it over the city? Um, I think the answer is somewhere in between. Um, so, like, I think part of it is the, the aesthetic, the flapper girl. Um, you know that it's this beautiful yet uh, ultimately empty woman. Um, whether that be Zelda or um, I, I, unfortunately I can't think of the, the woman that um, it's just failing me because of the hour, I guess uh, the woman that Fitzgerald was originally obsessed with. I think a lot of this kind of all swirls together to kind of create this, this figure that can be all things that can be reflective of the time that can be reflective of individual characters in the book or of kind of the insights that Fitzgerald has. And maybe that's why it's so successful is, yeah. um, it's it, it can be so many things so many different people i even look at the the lights on it you know the, the green light as a teardrop that there's it's so metaphorical but I, like if you look at the cover you know the 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 lights at the bottom um you know they they you looking at them they can be so many different things they can be yeah. a city it almost looks like uh if, if you see a like a, a fair or a circus it or a like Coney park Island, kind of. exactly and so like, you can read into it what you want, right? Is yeah. this, you know, like mirage-like illusion of a beautiful city unfolding before you? Is it this amusement park for adults? Um, or is it something slightly more cis? There's lots of ye reds and yellows in yeah. there, um, which are typically seen as not comforting colors. Some of the um, early drafts have uh, much more of like a doom and gloom look to it, like a valley yes, exactly. kind of look to it. Yeah. And I think that he's like, well, I don't necessarily have to draw, you know, paint that. I can paint. Yep. What, I mean, the whole book is about superficiality. So he yep. paints something that on the surface looks straightforward. Oh, yeah, that's a city. But yeah, when you start, I mean, especially on the left side where you have what looks like a Ferris wheel. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's it's very much like. You know, oh yeah, maybe it's not actually a amusement park; it's a city. But isn't the city for these people in the age group that they're, you know, like an amusement park for them? Exactly. And constantly, constantly. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. It, and it's it's almost you know. So when it comes to the behaviors and ideas, it's almost like the artist Francis Cujo was like, "Thank you for painting or for writing such a illustrative book yeah. with so much depth in its simplicity. I mean, the book is not super long. No, nope. it's, it's not incredibly. I mean, I think that for, and I'll include myself in this when I was mm -hmm. in high school and I read it, I was, this was one of the first books that I really understood symbolism. I really, you know, was able to wrap my head around mm -hmm. The way that he uses everything from geography to technology to uh, to get across a larger idea, and I felt like I was like, yes, like great success, like this is like <laughs> awesome. You know, I I never actually said great success when I was in eleventh grade, but the the idea was just like ah, you know, it was almost like a lob and you hit a home run. You know, you know, it's like you didn't hit a home run off a ninety five mile an hour fastball, but you you still hit a home run exactly by cracking the code you know, cracking yeah. the egg. Um, but <laughs> so it's almost like when, you know, when he took on this project of painting the cover art, he was like, thank you. Because now I get to do an equally uh, seemingly simple picture, but just totally full of, you know, because it's a seemingly simple story. Yeah. But it becomes the more you read it and, you know, the second time you read it, the third time you read it, just the layers of it. And this also has layers to it. Well, that's, you know, I, 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 in, 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 in schools and public education, we're always talking about, you know, how to innovate, how to grow with the times, what should we leave behind, what should we hang on to? And there, there's this big thrust um, to like, just let the kids read what they want to read or just read modern stuff. And I do lend credit to that. Like you do always want to kind of keep growing and be open to change. But I look at Gatsby and I look at the, the cover of this and the, one of the reasons I keep fighting for it uh, is, like you said, this is, for a lot of kids, this is the first time where they read something and it clicks. 
you know, maybe not because they, they identify with Gatsby or they identify with any characters in here, but it, it's such a perfect application of what literature can be where it doesn't need to be as much as I love Moby Dick. It doesn't need to be 400 pages of omniscient narrator giving me the history of every single island we pass by mm-hmm. um, and kind of beating me over the head. I, I, I love Moby Dick, but you look at Gatsby and it don't, it, it's, it's almost frustrating because it, I know it was not effortless that he poured in so much of his soul into the drafts of this, but it feels effortless. Like, like watching, you know, I, I go back and watch some of the old musicals, um, you know, Bing Crosby and, and, and those guys yeah. and see them sing and dance. And it almost feels like a camera just happened beyond right. when this effortless thing happened. And that's the feeling I get when I read Gatsby um, and, and even like look at the cover that, you know, culturally, it, it just, it's so significant because it feels so much more effortless and that it has so many layers and so many ways to look at it and so many things you can talk about it. And I'm sure part of that is just who Fitzgerald was and knowing his history just adds depth yeah. to it, but nothing, no, not nothing. I want to, I want to be careful not to be a, a cranky old man, but so little of what comes out now takes a lesson from that, that either you're beat over the head with, with symbolism or metaphor, or it is just superficial storytelling where, where things happen. Um, you know, I, I do some creative writing in my classes, you know, particularly my comic book class. And I talk about how many, like so many writers get stuck in this trap of, and then, you know, yeah. like something cool happens and then this happens and then this happens and then this happens. And there's no connective tissue between it. Whereas like, like what you're saying with, with Gatsby, everything swirls together into mm-hmm. to something more. Um, the, the, there's so much depth to it. I think that that speaks to the art as well. Um, maybe because of the art. Of, yeah, yeah. And it's funny because this painting is part of that connective tissue. And exactly. It's interesting because there's no tissue visible, <laughs> right? I yeah. Mean, her, her, you don't see actual skin on this, yeah. you know, as far as, you know, the face itself is not connected to anything, but I mean, what a perfect thing for, uh, man, it just hit me actually looking at this. I'm like, so you, you, you're first encountered with a face and yeah. what's behind a face in, you know, the human anatomy is the brain. Mm. And so it's just almost empty. like the book itself is the brain. And yeah. the, the face is, you know, just holding it all in. And just as exactly. soon as you open up the cover, you're like, welcome to, you know, my mind. This is yeah. everything I, that's been going on. And, and and he definitely was, I mean, this is 1920s pop culture. And as far as like what, which contributed to the writing of the book, because it's yeah. set in the 20s. It's not set in any other time period. It's, it's yeah. real time. I think it was in 1922 that the, the story takes place. And then, uh, you know, the book, he writes it and then published in 25. So it's it's contemporary. Yeah. It is pop culture. And I don't think he had any illusions. And that includes why this particular designer was asked to, to paint it, that it was going to become popular. You know, he went with a big time, um publisher to, to get this done and just to backtrack to i mean there's really no order to the questions but i, I just want to no. bring this one up um where was it made it was made entirely in new york and it's about new york it, the whole i mean the 20s equals new york i mean new york is the the centerpiece of you know you can't get any further east than new york but it's the centerpiece of the whole country and it it just epitomizes the 20s so much and the other part is what locations are associated with this source and it's nationwide. Yeah. Uh, everyone around the country, around the world had access to this almost immediately. And um, a couple of things that that tells us, you know, one New York city, uh, our understanding of New York city as being this uh, center of the Western world, you know, the new mm-hmm. Rome is something that really didn't start taking shape until about a hundred years before this book came out. Yeah, that around the time of the the end of the Revolutionary War and into the early 19th century, Philadelphia was the bigger city. Philadelphia oh, so had a lot more sway. That's why Philadelphia served as the capital. Well, New York did for a time too, but um, it was the the building of the Erie Canal that really transformed New York into becoming 100. You know, well before 100 years later, but by 100 years later, that's why the financial you know capital of the of the country was at the mouth, the meeting place between Atlantic Ocean and uh, the Great Lakes was uh-huh. by way of the canal. You know, that's where the money exchanged. And that's where, yeah. what a perfect place to have a publishing 
industry <laughs> because the books are going to be written and even if they're not written in New York itself, but this one was, uh, even if they're not, you know, New York isn't the actual setting, but they're going to be edited, they're going to be published, they're going to have all the, the marketing coming out of New York, and then it is just going to explode out to the rest of the country. And yep. it can only do that with a growing road network and infrastructure. Yeah. You know, so you have, you know, the the canal days have long since been gone by. The railroads were still very much prominent. I mean, that's something, one of the greatest achievements of the, the transcontinental railroad completion uh, 50 some odd years before was that it, it connected the country culturally, that you could read a book in San Francisco that came from New York and yeah. get the same ideas as somebody else. It wasn't something like you had only regional uh, books and things like that. And so people started to like I said before, understand the same language, talk, you know, the same way, um, have references, you know, you and I are making this podcast about this particular book cover, and it's not going to be just somebody close by that knows of it. It's world over yeah. has had yeah. access to this. So uh, it really, you know, the reason that it was even made in the first place in New York and the fact that it got such widespread uh, distribution because of it, it says so much about the growing network of roads and railroads that the 1920s, I mean, it was, it's by no coincidence, but end of that decade, yeah. you had the US highway system had been formulated and Congress was spending money uh, putting together a, a organized way that cars and trucks and everything else could drive around mm -hmm. the entire network of roads throughout the country and, you know, alleviate the uh the traffic and the make it much safer something that was going to become uh even more defined about 30 years later with the the interstate highways yeah uh, i went off the deep end there but uh just to bring it home <laughs> yeah so anyway cars do play a role in the great gatsby too so, <laughs> uh, so the last question is um is this prescriptive as in is it trying to make you think a certain way or do something or is it descriptive and for this particular piece of artwork, yeah, I think we've mentioned it a few times, but it's definitely both because yeah, well, with any kind of marketing, you want somebody to think a certain way and they literally want you to book, judge a book by its cover. I mean, that's the idea. Exactly. Here. Yeah. If, if they didn't want you to, to uh, know anything about what was in the book, they would just leave the cover blank. You know, the dust jacket would be torn off. They wouldn't even just bother with it. Uh, so it is prescriptive in that we want you to be drawn into this book. You want to read it so that the cover will make sense. Uh -huh. But do, do you think it's, it is in fact descriptive as well? And I mean, it's a modern art piece, so it's not easy to crack. It's not like some no. of the other cover arts where it's like, here's, <laughs> you know, the great Gatsby is standing next to an automobile. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's like, I, I uh, uh, one of the one of the elements to the boom in literacy and literature is, are pulp novels, uh, you know, the, the early 1910s through 1920s, yeah. um, which for a lot of Americans, that was a, it was seen as low entertainment, though. If you go and read some of those, it's not low. I mean, the subject material is in often cases low entertainment, but the writing, you know, Edgar Rice Burroughs, that's it's where he got his start. It's the majority of his novels kind of fall into that pulp um, kind of genre. But if you look at the covers to those, um, a lot of them are, they're crass, they're, they're designed to be just like attract people because it's got, you know, beautiful women and dangerous scenarios yeah. and stuff like that. Whereas Gatsby, it, it is both, you know, it, 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 it reflects both sides of that because there was such a connection between artist and material and writer and, and kind of that flow back and forth that it works as a way to kind of look into the novel and be reflective of that. Um, but also kind of to, to almost, I feels like control where the novel went um, and, and interact with the reader themselves. Yeah. And that's uh, I, all great art. That's what it does. It, it tells a story. It reflects who created it, the time in which they created it, the subject material, but also creates a, a discussion within the viewer um, and, and, you know, creates emotions within the viewer. And I think that this, contrary to what most art or cover art is this one does exactly that and it it came together so organically too which i think yeah. says so much about how this 
age was the beginning of all this. I mean, I, my point of reference for most of the publishing world comes entirely from the movie Elf, uh, <laughs> where you get to see the inside of how they make children's books. And you know, it's, I, I do know a bit more about the, the publishing industry beyond that, too. But my understanding, like you were mentioning before, is that a lot of times uh, it does reflect any other corporation where it's like we have this department you know the art department will take care of this and then the yeah. editing department will do that and there's really not that kind of um you know we like to think that there is a lot more synergy in companies in the modern era but a lot of it you know you can have an entire picture book done where the artist will never meet the illustrator exactly no communication that the illustrator just gets an assigned you know you kind of picture them as sitting side by side in a nice little rustic, you know, cabin in the countryside somewhere. And, oh, let's write our book together. And as, <laughs> as the writer is, you know, on an old typewriter tapping away, you have the illustrator painting and, oh, yes, this is, you know, but it's nothing like that. It's very much, nope. you know, very uh, machine like in some ways. It's like production um, where they just get these contracts out. And, but with this one, it because it was in the opening stages of the, what would eventually develop into what I just described. It's the opening stages of it so much more organic. Yeah, that it's it's like the first time around with something like this, it's going to be the best one. Where it wasn't just you know, all right, go down the hall and you know, get old uh, Frankie C. You know, he's our best illustrator. Um, he's he's going to whip something your, up. Yeah, you know, your picture, your book with the eyes and stuff. You know, that he's going to yeah. come up. You know, he's going to work that up. Well, no, that's, that's, the, that's, that's how you get covers with just like the, the grill to Gatsby's car, which yeah. is a part of the novels to be certain, but it's not, there isn't a conversation there. It's not, it's not depth. It's just, a, you know, yeah. it's like, it's like if you see um, covers to, you know, the, the DVD version of Jaws, you know, <laughs> you have the iconic, you know, picture and like some have the original poster where it's, you know, the, the deep water and the yeah. below it, but like some of them are just like, it's like a thin um, occasionally okay. I, I do like to, I do like, this is such a weird avenue to go down, but I do like to look at cover art, um, for like DVDs and stuff like that when they're released in other countries. Yeah. Um, the, the translations are always kind of funny or weird or idiosyncratic, or in some cases like better. Um, yeah. but the, the art they choose to use, because I, I think there's licensing issues. The art they choose to use is not always the art that is on the, you know, American or Western mm. world. Uh, versions and sometimes th th there's you know there's some brilliance there but other times it really is just like we, we took an element of it and we just slapped it on the, the box like, well, like i mean i'm gonna i'm gonna give a, a shout out to one of my favorite um youtubers uh a guy named minty who does oh, yeah, a, yeah, yeah he does his top 10 uh things you didn't know about and he usually does movies and one of the a regular feature that he'll do is he'll bring up posters of in or or dvd covers um from the international you know, most of the movies he, he reviews are from the united states and so he'll show what it looked like when it came out in japan or how it came out yeah in germany and italy and, and some of them like you said it just look it, sometimes it's better other yeah. times he'll, he'll point out he's like i don't know why they're focusing on this particular yeah character or element and making that the centerpiece of the painting but again that's a primary source of that time and place that yeah. the audiences in that country in that time period were maybe more interested in uh you know whatever character from uncle buck that they chose to make as the <laughs> you know center macaulay culkin becomes the star of right. uncle buck well they yeah. did that they did that for my girl oh um, they certainly did in a big way and i can't believe that that has come up into my podcast more than a couple times already uh but yeah they they really the way they marketed that movie was coming off of home alone they're like well you know this is basically another macaulay culkin movie even though he's not the main character no uh, by i mean he's an important character but he's not the the main one he's much more um, of a plot device than anything else you know going back to the, the book covers though i you know we were talking about this and i've seen so there's that there's a, a famous um set of of photographs i mean he, he wrote his own book called how the other half lives jacob reese yeah uh, his 1890s um lecture turned foot you know photographic journal in a book where he has it's that famous uh photograph of you know a, a, an alley in skid row where you see all these various uh characters you know kind of figures standing off and you know looking at, at different 
phases of up to no goodness you know, <laughs> kind of looking back at the camera. And, uh, you know, so that was incorporated into his book. So it makes sense when that is on the cover of different versions of that book. But I've seen that yeah. paint. I've seen that same photograph used for uh, the gangs of New York, which oh, yeah. is a, you know, a, a book that uh, eventually inspired in some ways the Scorsese movie sort uh, of years later. I mean, it's just a documentary chronicle of you know so my copy of the gangs of new york the book has that photograph on it i've also seen yeah. it on the cover of maggie a girl of the streets yes right? yeah uh, and so it's like and the way they just kind of like okay so the this is about 19th century you know late 19th century new york go you know just like <laughs> slap that picture up there and, and there's really no if if the fact that you can take the same photograph and use it interchangeably between titles just kind of shows how disconnected the you know the, especially with the the um what do you call it when it, everything's fair game the the uh well copyright laws yeah the when the copyrights expired and it oh, becomes public use, domain yeah. public domain and fair use that you can just yeah we you know i'm sure that photograph doesn't have the copyright anymore or whatever mm -hmm. and they could just use it and really it just nilly. kind of peters out but with with this one in particular uh it, it really is so much of a both prescriptive descriptive and shows us so much about the time period and uh is there any last words that you want to say about the great gatsby's book cover the celestial eyes well i i just i just want to touch back just briefly what, what you were just oh, talking sure. about like like this 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 cover on so many fronts is the exception, not the rule. You know, you look at the publishing aspect, the rule is no, the publishers just, they get in-house artists, just slap something on it. And it, it really is. It, it's, it's rarely that we get something like this. I was just watching um, the man who invented Christmas uh, about Charles Dickens writing a Christmas Carol, oh. which I, I love the movie. I, I'm not exactly sure how factual it is um, though. I, I, I know there's a book that I have yet to read uh, that kind of covers the material, but, a big part of it is he wants illustrations to the book uh, because you kind of need those. Um, and the, you know, his publishers are, they just have like a, an average artist that they just use routinely. He's like, no, 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 it must be this person. I'm like, what? what are, are you kidding me? Like, there's no time to do this. The end of the mind, he, he makes this big point of, no, I'm going to go make my case to this person. And it's a, it's a turning point in the movie. Um, and I think Gatsby and the cover, you know, I, I'm sure it's not as dramatic as that, but I think it is documents like this. Um, where there is care and attention and they, it's so intertwined with the material, the people, the history, the demand um, that, that, that that's why you have this podcast to talk about stuff like that. And that's why it is a part of our national identity, a, a part of our global identity. This book is, yeah. it, it's printed, I, I don't know how many countries, but I'm sure a very good deal of them have had access to this book and it is iconic. Um, it's why they keep making movies out of it, you know, and, and why, it's taught in so many yeah. you know, high schools and, and discussed and, 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 you know, keeps getting brought up um, in, in the national discourse um, that, that it's just, it's the exception, not the rule. It's, it's yeah. just a significant contribution. It probably is one of the most um, hinted at or referenced in other pop culture of, oh. I mean, it's, it's a sure thing that if you reference some kind, I was just watching, uh, two of my favorite comedy shows both start with the uh, title King of. Uh, <laughs> so there's the King of Queens and the King of and King of the Hill. And I was just watching episodes of those recently uh, yep. where uh, Hank Hill and King of the Hill is hoping to save up money to buy uh, a new patio set from the, the Gatsby collection. <laughs> and, and it's by the end of the episode, he finally gets enough to to buy two of them, including I think it's the Buchanan recliner or something like that. And, <laughs> and it's like this 20s esque you know, looking thing. And then the other one is uh, and it makes sense for the King of Queens, considering that Queens is a component in the story that yep. uh, there's a few references to it, including one where he is unsure what it's even about because his wife Carrie really wants to to read you know she she gets laid off and so she is like I, I finally want to do something with my life like I just want to take some time for me and I want to I've never read the great Gatsby I want to read the great Gatsby and so later in the episode he's like 
well, I mean, the Great Gatsby is a magician, right? And, she, and she's <laughs> like, well, like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, that's why he's, he's the Great Gatsby. You know, he's like, <laughs> that's why I assume he's like, <laughs> yeah, he's never read it himself. Yeah. Um, but it's references like that. I mean, it's funny because they assume most of the audience either had to or on their own volition read this book. And yeah, they get they they they're able to get that kind of low humor joke that he is because a it's lovable buffoon becomes such a part of our yeah. And so just from that simple walk down the street a couple of months ago, where I took a look in the window and saw a very recent cover of this book, I got ah, I said that that is not the Gatsby cover that should be there. No, it really ought to be some version of Celestial Eyes because it is both descriptive, prescriptive, and such a perfect perfect uh symbol of the time period so yeah. i really appreciate you taking the time uh, hey thanks for having about me. this and i hope it's not the last time because you and oh, I certainly not. have some really great uh conversations whether it be about 1989 batman or in this case 1925 celestial eyes the cover of the great gatsby <laughs> uh so thank you again hey thanks for having me and um, for everyone listening, please check us out on all the major platforms, including Instagram, Facebook, Patreon. Uh, just recently, if you become a Patreon patron, there is some good stuff for you. First tier, you can get a sticker. Uh, second tier, you can offer up ideas about what you'd like to have us analyze on the show. And third tier, uh, not only is there a t-shirt involved in that, but also you can be a guest commentator. And it's something that I find is especially helpful um, because these are just great conversations that you and I would already have. Yeah. But we might as well put a microphone in front of us and see how it goes. So <laughs> thank you for joining us on the EPS podcast where everything, including the 1925 cover of The Great Gatsby, is a primary source. We'll talk to you next time. <laughs>